this is this is a fleet biplane okay. made in Fort Erie, actually, not in Buffalo. Reuben Fleet was the founder of Consolidated Aircraft, uh, and they built they built aircraft in Buffalo, flying boats and other things. But he wanted to build civilian airplanes, so he started a separate little company in, in Fort Erie, Fleet Aircraft. And one of these things that they made was this this fleet biplane. Uh, Reuben Fleet wanted this to be sold primarily for civilian use as a trainer or that sort of thing, but uh, the U.S. Navy actually bought six of them uh, for a very special purpose. And if you look at the patch on the side of the biplane here, you see two men, uh, the men on the flying trapeze. And that's because these aircraft, as purchased by the Navy, were to be launched and recovered from the Navy airships Akron and Macon. And if you look in here, you can see a fleet biplane that actually hooks onto the trapeze and gets winched into the hangar inside the airship. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know what I love about this period? It's crazy. Like, just to think of, because people were so passionate and so excited about what they were doing, mm -hmm. that I think they just threw caution to the wind. Mm -hmm. And they had to, because the only way this technology was going to advance was people just saying, you know what, I'm going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll and try it. And it, it worked. You know. you know, these two airships, which are about the size of the German Hindenburg, which obviously a lot of people are familiar yep. with, were flying aircraft carriers. They were... They were specifically built for that purpose. It's not like they had the airships sure. and the aircraft was an afterthought. So these airships were designed to hold four Curtis fighters and this one fleet biplane, and they were to be used for scouting purposes by the U.S. Navy uh, in lieu of the role that would normally be performed by destroyers right. or cruisers. How cool, though, when you think about, you know, uh, my grandparents, uh, their whole house was like a library, and they used to buy all those uh, Time Life uh, you know, like, this is the a glimpse of the future type of thing. And it'd be all these beautiful painted map paintings of, like, airship wars. And, you know, you get to, like, this is just so forward thinking for its time. And, you know, like, who thought of that? Who's like, you know what? Why don't we just go up in the air <laughs> with the runway? And we'll just drop them yeah. <laughs> off yeah. of them. Well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get dropped. They would lower them out. They'd hoist them And out. then they'd be hanging from the hook, and they would fly up and just fly back. In I fact, the pilots who were already aircraft carrier qualified, once they gained airship certification and learned how to do it, they said it was actually easier to oh, take wow. off and land from the trapeze on the airship really? than on an aircraft carrier. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. I would imagine, I mean, the aircraft carriers, too, at that time were, I mean, it was pretty they, precarious. They were, they were smaller, but of course, the planes were going a lot slower sure, than, so the, you than the jets were today. Right. We can definitely talk about this. Yeah. This is the Cunningham Hall. Uh, GA-36. What most people don't realize, of course, people have heard of Curtis, they've heard of Bell, but in the 20s and 30s, there were many small aircraft manufacturers in western New York. One of them was the, the Cunningham Hall Company in Rochester, New York, uh, founded by two gentlemen, Cunningham and Hall, and they built this aircraft to compete for an Army training contract. And it has a very unusual arrangement for a short takeoff and landing. Instead of conventional flaps, it has this flap-like surface under the wing to help it take off and land in shorter distances. Uh, they made two of them, uh, and the museum, actually it, it wasn't our museum, it was the Amherst Museum really? about 25 years ago, give or take, purchased this aircraft uh, it was junk in a farmer's field. We have some photographs of it over here. So it's just decomposing. You can see oh, gosh. the picture of the aircraft right there as it was when we, uh, not we, when our predecessor, the Amherst Museum, um, acquired it. And a bunch of very capable men, mostly Bell retirees, uh, restored it to the beautiful condition that you can see it's in now. And you guys picked it up from there. When the, when the Amherst Museum uh, got rid of their aviation collection, yep. our museum had already started and they donated it to us. And so now the wings on this, this is a whole other style, correct? Oh. Well, this is, this is a monoplane. Okay. Uh, instead of a biplane, it only has a single wing. You can see this, the aluminum frame inside the wing. We deliberately covered this with plexiglass instead of cloth so you could see it. And of course, in case no one has noticed, the fuselage is made of metal because this is progressing into the metal era of aircraft. Okay. But the control surfaces and the wings are still very tight doped cloth. Okay. And we'll talk about that transition from cloth to metal more on the Curtis side.